Isn't God good? All the time. All the time. God is good. Everybody stand up. Gotta have a good day with the Lord this morning. I know that we're gonna have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time in Him. Let's say this together. Spiritual warfare, hopefully you get it in your spirit. When you get it down in your spirit, we're good saying it so much. But I want I want us to get, get this down pat because <clears throat> we need to understand this when we're going through things that, that we're not as helpless as we might think we are. Spiritual warfare is 10% Satan's tactics, 90% how we respond. Remember with God, we are not helpless, but helpless, hopeless, but we are powerful. Give Lord a hand out. Oh, pray. God is so, 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 so awesome. Say this together with me. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one. Accept my worship. Oh, Lord. Give Lord another. Amen. Let's pray. There we go. Let's go and sing this together. Everybody, let's sing. Ready? Sometimes getting it started is not always so easy. <laughs> I see.
you're going to see in the back, but you just see this is where this is your line of sight of progressive lenses. And the rest of us kind of worry. And I was playing and I turned around. A little water, you had a little water dancing. And I thought it was Wayne. I said, <laughs> I said Wayne's getting down today. <laughs> had a little water. Uh, yeah. That is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, these things here, you know, you know, I think you're not cool. God is so good all the time. God is good. We're going to do communion. And we've got it up here. We've got you need to take it. Take it the way we want to take it, or you can take it. We've also got the, 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 the communion up there with the cup. And if you're here and your spouse or somebody that's only here is not here and you want to give them a cup to take home with them, just reach there and grab them a cup. If you want to take a, you a cup to uh, uh, do communion with them, that's fine. And you can take bread communion here, however you want to do it. But, but don't let anybody that wants communion uh, not have the opportunity to do it because, because it's just a very powerful, powerful experience. We thank God for that opportunity to have communion. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 23. For I received the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when you give it thanks, you pray to the sick, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do remembers to me, after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, many sleep. For we would judge ourselves, we should not. Be just. Right now, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to touch us and bring to your memory if there's something there that you need to repent of. And if there's things you already know, that too, because there's a sin of omission and sin of commission, things you should have done and you didn't. And uh, uh, omission, is, or that's omission, and things that commission is things you should have, you should have done that you did. Either way, that's the thought of God. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you're all powerful and almighty. We thank you, God, that you got everything under control. We ask you right now, Lord, to touch into a in a very powerful way, to have your will and to have your way in our lives right now. God, you're an awesome God. You're a powerful God. And I thank you, God, that you see us, you see us where we're at, and you meet us where we're at. And you never leave us the same, but you take us to where you want us to be. I ask you right now, Lord, if there's any attitudes, our actions in my heart and life, in our heart and life, that does not please you, we give it to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for it. And Lord, we know, God, none of us are perfect. We'll never be perfect, but we trust in your perfect sacrifice because we know that your Son is the most powerful in delivering us from our sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. Brother Wayne, can you come and get the brother? This is a new thing called Slick 50. Uh, slick 50 hand sanitizer. It keeps holding up. There you go. The Bible said, well, the night was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. And he blessed it and said, Take eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Also, the same night, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, This is my blood shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. Come, let us join.
Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. God is awesome. All the time. All the time. Oh, yes. God is awesome. <laughs> I hope you go expecting today. And I promise you, whatever you came expecting is what you're going to get. Amen. Amen. Let's all let's first, yeah, let's all stand. The green word. I was going to my new glasses come in, so I quit tripping over stuff. I keep hearing how good these progressive lenses are, but I only I've only had two people to like them. Everybody else goes, ah. Oh. I said I agree. <clears throat> Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. Have a real word. <laughs> That's why I was saved in. You don't say on me. Alright, ready? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jephthah, his father in law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even the heart. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, while the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet from the place wherein thou standest on the holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon him. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am come out to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of the best land into a good land, and a large into a land full of milk and, the milk and honey, into a place of the Can Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Berezites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites. <laughs> Just see if you're listening. Yeah. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me. I have all I've also see the oppression where the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth 
my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, wait a minute, who am I? That I should go unto Pharaoh, and I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, Certainly I'll be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, I will serve that you will serve God upon this mountain. We're going to stop right there for right now. Let's just work your hand. Ask God for a special anointing and a special touch. We know God's got this. Lord, we love you, Father. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you are alive and on the throne, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that you do not see. And there's nothing in our life that you do not care about. And there's nothing, there's not a need that we have that you can meet if we just trust you. Lord, we thank you, God, for all you do, for all you say. We trust you for the power of your word, the power of your spirit, the power of your blood, of your son. We ask you right now, Lord, bless this service in the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Look at somebody and tell them, look at them and say, the past is behind yes. us. The future, the future is ahead, ahead of us. us. God is we with us. us. And, and nothing, nothing, and nothing, nothing shall be involved. impossible. God is awesome. Give Lord a hand clap. You ever pick up a hitchhike? Every now and then you pick up a hitchhiker, you know, if I feel led, I'll pick them up. But I really have to really, really, really feel led. You know, pick up a hitchhiker. He asked me if I was afraid that he might. He said, aren't you afraid that I'll be a serial killer? And I said, wow. I said, uh, what's the odds of two serial killers being in the same car? <laughs> He was, he was swimming there, Ryan. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Now, this is part one. I might not have part one written up there, uh, but, but it is part one. And the name of it is literally, excuse me. Y'all say to me, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, my boys should say, excuse me, Dad. Just not going to come over here. I'll excuse you. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're talking about, we're going to talk about uh, excuses. Now, <laughs> let's go a little bit further. Here we go. We're going to kind of lighten it up and start with this. It's going to get kind of heavy. So let's just, let's just go ahead. But uh, uh, anybody, anybody knows it's not crazy that the world has gotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just gotten crazy. It's gone in high speed. It's gone crazy, crazy, crazy. Yep. I've never seen how crazy any crazier time than it is. And I've never seen so many people divided. Instead of a common purpose and a common goal and looking for something to have in common, we're always looking for differences so we can just pick, 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 pick. Instead of looking for a common goal and pull together. So, so, I'm going to show you something here. Now, now is not the time to lay low. Now is not the time to stay in the shallows. Now is the time for the church to rise up, rise and shine. Because the Democrats do not have the answer. The Republicans do not have the answer. The Independents don't have the answer. Whoever is running to be in the president of the state, or uh, Joe Biden doesn't have the answer. The next president going to my family, whether it's him or somebody else, does not have the answer. The answer, look, when I was in the fountain, the reason we were so effective and and we and the job got was just so powerful because I quit going to the top for problems and I started starting at the bottom. I went to the lowest man that had his hand on the boat. The lowest man that worked on that problem. That's the first guy I'd always go to. Not the big guys, I went to the lowest guy. And that's how we got problems solved. We don't either think that Washington can solve our problems. The church is going to solve the problems. I mean, we've got an answer. We've got Jesus. That's why trying to stop us so bad on talking about him stop us from being the church we are sitting on a hill that cannot be hid we're the salt of the world and we're the light of the world how many knows that Amen. how many know that god hasn't changed his mind we are still sitting on the hill they cannot be hid we're still the salt of the world we're still the light of the world and we need to stand up and let the world come but instead, 
Mm. Y'all read that before I say it, so it won't have such a powerful punch when I say it. We, not just the church, but the world, but the church itself, has become a generation of excuses. Why? It's terrible. I, you know, I, I, I look and all you hear is excuses. I, I went to Lowe's the other day and they said, you know, for your Lowe's card, uh, uh, put your number in. And so I put my phone number in and said, don't see it. I put in Linda's number, and it was my card, and it used to work, and it didn't work. So I asked my young lady, who actually, I was disturbing her. She was walking around doing her fingernails. And I said, uh, can, can I get some help over here? She said, yes. And I said, my, my number's not working. She said, it's your card. I said, she said, you need to re-enter your card. I said, ma'am, I don't have a card. It's not taking my number. She said, well, you've got to re-enter your card. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm telling you, I don't have a card. I'm putting the number in, and it won't take the number. She said, well, I don't know what to you then. And she walked off. And I said, the, the, the first thing, I'm like, no, more customer service. It's like just a load. It's a Walmart. It's a food line. It's all over the place. We have traded excellence for excuses. Wow. Think about it. Used to, people got up, took care of business. If they were trying to help you, they helped you. They appreciated your business. They appreciated you coming in. They helped you, but nowadays, that's kind of far and in between. Used to, people checked you out. Now, you need to uncheck it. I went there one day to Walmart and said, can I get a custom, can I get an employee discount? They said, do you work there? I said, no, but I checked myself out. <laughs> I do all my stuff. I come in, I got a little thing on my app on my phone, and I check all my prices on the thing because the price is on the shelf and the price of the product usually don't match. So I, I'm checking all the prices. And I said, when I go to check out, I have to go to a self checkout. I check myself out. I buy my own stuff. I do it all. So I said, uh, so uh, why can't I get an employee discount? And she said, sir, and that was it. So, We've traded excellence. Yeah. Or excuses. It's all over the place. Instead of searching for a way for things to be excellent, we search for an excuse to explain mediocrity. I remember when I first went to Fountain, and you heard me tell the story before, but that was 750 reoccurring problems. And when they hired me, they said, here, welcome to Fountain. And they said, make it stop. And so I went to find out what was going on. They were starting at the top, and I couldn't ever get anything because of bureaucracy. They couldn't get anything done because they were starting at the top. So I started at the bottom. And once the people finally understood, I wasn't there to fire them. I wasn't there to get them in trouble. I was there to keep things going, keep things moving. In the very first year, we went from 750 reoccurring problems down to below 200 in the very first year. Saved a million dollars because I refused to make an excuse. I refused. And you go into meetings and it'd be, well, so I thought it was his fault. Uh, it's his fault uh, because blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, nope. they already come to me. I said, I got this. I'm sorry. I, I, I messed up. I, I'll fix it. No, I wasn't the one. It didn't matter. Because I knew the ball stopped, the, the, the ball stopped with me, so I went ahead and just went ahead and took it. And one day I was sitting there, and the other engineer was sitting beside me, and I've been begging him to help me, and begging him to do this part. And he had not done it, he just kept doing his own thing. And I got in the meeting, and Mr. Fountain there was said, looked at me and said, David? I said, yes, sir. He said, why haven't this been fixed? The truth was, the other guy. I couldn't get him to move. I couldn't get him to do his thing. I couldn't do his job. He couldn't do mine. He would not do it. When well, Mr. Pine looked at me and said, Whose fault is this? Instead of pointing over here, I said, I'll take responsibility, Mr. Pine. And I'll get it done. He said, and he quit fussing. 
He said, okay, thank you. <coughs> and I told the other guy, I said, quit making excuses. And let's go ahead and get something done. Well, nowadays, there's so much media I keep going on. And all I ever hear is, well, it's because of COVID. It's because of the economy. It's because we don't have any time. It's because we don't have any money. I hear that all the time. And it honestly, it drives me nuts. We get going to the store somewhere, and I come out, and walk down the we'll be shaking our heads because if you have to interact with somebody or, or, or looking for prices, and the prices don't match if you go check it out, and it's three times what it says it's going to be on the shelf. And I, 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 I told her, I, I told her so I just, it just drives me crazy. It's a mediocre uh, attitude that the world is getting. The sad part is, this attitude creeps into the church. I'm not saying you got it. I'm saying it is creeping into the church. See, remember, there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. A reason is legitimate, an excuse is illegitimate. The reason is true, but an excuse well, it may not be, I don't know. A reason is something that you know, well, okay, it can't be done because it's too much, or it can't be done because of this, or, or somebody can't be there because they're sick, or they had a death in the family. That sort of thing is a reason. And usually when somebody gives me a reason, I feel it, everything's all right. When I get here excuses, I can tell it, I can feel it. <laughs> You know, I used to tell my team and family, quit making excuses. If you can't figure it out, come see me. We'll sit down. We'll work on it until we fix it. Do not go <laughs> to anybody out here and give them excuses. And when I remember going many, many times, going to the CEO or going to Mr. Fountain or going to the vice president of engineering, and whenever I went, instead of just telling me we had a problem, I always went to him with at least two, two choices, two choices to fix it, and even had to draw it out on paper for them so they could look at it. And most of the time, the CEO, I go to him and say, here's a problem we got, and here's, here's some options. He goes, he goes, some options? Yeah. And I put down two pieces of paper on the table while I draw it and put it down, and he would go, hmm, I like that one. And that was the end of it. Versus this little go around who's at fault, who's at fault, who's at fault, who's at fault. So now, here's some, here's some quotes on, I said we're going to have fun, but all this stuff will be fun. All right, get ready. <laughs> here's some quotes. Let's use this about all the time. He that's good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. Benjamin Franklin. Excuses are the crutches of the uncommitted. Here's the second one I use all the time. Excuses are really no excuse to build a house in failure. Abraham Lincoln. And here's my favorite. Excuses will always be there. Opportunity won't. Now, this is this is now it's gonna get ready to be a little funny. I hope. Y'all are not looking too, y'all ain't looking like it's funny yet, and I know it's not funny yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> excuse to throw that house, the nails just to build the house of failure. Like right here, go. Why is, I'm going to sit down for this one, because this is so good. Why is it that we feel we can offer excuses when it goes to church that would be ridiculous if you used it anywhere else? Years ago, Moody Month, you remember Moody? I went to two. Uh, when I was going for my uh, psych and counseling degree, uh, the number one in the world at the time of the Christian base was Lee University. Number two was Moody Bible Institute. That was number two. All right. So, so <laughs> what they did was, is they ran a piece that took those excuses people used for church and used why people might not be going to sporting events or why they wouldn't go to sporting events or why they quit sporting events. Really? Number one, every time I went, they asked for money. You get a minute, you go to the ball game, they'll pay to get in, <coughs> Cracker Jacks, whatever. Well, hit the wrong button, that's good. 
Come on up here. Get back up here. Come on. Number two. The people with whom I, whom I, I, that I had to sit with, they weren't very friendly. You ever heard of this in church? No. Remember, these are excuses in church. Moody took it and put it to a ball field. The seats were too hard and uncomfortable. The next one, the coach never came to see me. The referee made a decision which I could not agree. And finally, it seems that the game all of didn't start or didn't stop on time. Now, this, that, this, this is, these were kind of surface excuses. We're going to go deeper. Y'all say lower the flag. Lower the flag. We're going to talk about our own personal life now. Our own personal life. <laughs> And God wants to use you. How many know that? How many realize that God wants to use everybody in here? Yeah. How many have felt God in one way or another from time to time drop a nugget in your heart to help somebody or to say something? Oh, yeah. Or to do something? Some people get it confused and think the ministry, you've got to be up here in the pulpit, you've got to have the Bible, you've got to have Ministry. It's just that. It's helping people. Maybe it's going by and fixing the flat tire. Maybe it's helping somebody get their groceries to the car. All kinds of things. But the pulpit is one of them. So let me, let me go ahead and say this about Moses. Here we go. Here's Moses. If anybody had a call on their life to be used by God, it was Moses. Some falls in their life, in their life, it was Moses. So you know, some failure. We got some calls, we got some failures. How many here's got a failure in your life? Mm. How many's ever messed up? Mm. How many ever felt God tell you something and you didn't do it and you felt bad about it? Oh, yeah. How many ever did it your way instead of God's way and blew it? Hmm. Okay. Moses had a big mission, but it was overshadowed by five big excuses. Okay? Now, what caused these excuses? What caused him <laughs> to live in the land of Yemen? Yemen. He focused on the what ifs. Instead of what it is. <laughs> now, now, we're only going to look to excuses today, just two. There's five, maybe more, so we'll finish it up next week. Moses struggled with this identity. Moses, at one time, been a very, very, very powerful man. He was in line to possibly Pharaoh. He was a very powerful, powerful guy. He had so much more for him. He was trained in math and the sciences of the Egyptians. He oversaw the building of some very powerful things. We don't know exactly what he oversaw, but we know that he oversaw the building of these big monuments and these big rooms and these big things that the Egyptians had. He was in control of a lot of things. Right now, in this moment, in that burning bush, even 40 years since he stood in Egypt. It's been 40 years since he had the power just to say it, snap his fingers, and people died. Snap his fingers, and people were promoted, and people were demoted. Snap his fingers, and they waited on him hand and foot. He's been 40 years in the desert. And at the end of these 40 years, God calls him from his burning bush. And he said, I know what's going on with my people. I'm going to use you to bring them out. Let's just stop and camp here for a moment. 
What's going on that Moses, who knew who he was when he was in Egypt, and felt qualified to lead a nation, the largest nation in the world, now when God speaks to him 40 years later, he goes, I think he got the wrong meaning. I think he should have picked somebody else, God, because I don't think that I got what it takes. There's some of you here right now, and years ago, you felt God nudging you one way or another to do something, to do whatever. It may have been a, 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 a literal ministry call, or it could have been uh, just to be helping people or to do things. But be a minister and life hits you and it hits you hard. And everything that you thought was going to happen didn't. You had it all figured out, all planned out, God, you know what I mean? We got this. And life didn't just hit hard. Life landed on you and crushed you. And all you can think is, God, what happened? If you really want to use me, why is all this happening to me? You see, in Moses' heart, Moses, who now thinks he's worthless, is more valuable than he's ever been. He doesn't see that. Moses, who was in line for a king, he had a king's heart. God says, I need that king's heart. But in order to use that king's heart, <coughs> I've got to soften it with the shepherd's heart. i got to combine it. Pure king, he run over people. Pure king, he went out to see people's needs. Pure king, he want people to wait on him. There's people in the ministry today, they want people to wait on them. And understand why they need to be waited on. Well, that's not ministry. That's having servants. Ministry is all about being a servant. So in order for Moses to be used, God had to break him. The whole reason they left Egypt was because he started feeling the call of God in his heart. And he knew that he had, he felt the call to deliver the people. When he saw an Egyptian beating one of his people, he goes and kills the Egyptian and buries him and frees his, uh, his people. And now he's hated by his people and he's hated by the Egyptians. He's banished. <laughs> so he's already tried. He's already thought that he was supposed to be delivered to the children of Israel, but the harder he tried, the worse he got. And so now, 40 years previous, he felt the call, but he didn't have the resources. He had not been trained. He had not all the right stuff yet. And so God was going to take this man with us, with a king's heart and mold him to the shepherd's heart. And although Moses, all he saw was that he'd been knocked down about 25, 35, 100 notches, actually, he was going up. He just couldn't see it. Because all he could see is that house laying on top of him. All he could see was where he was once known by everybody, he's a nobody. I don't even know him. He's out the backside of the desert, leading sheep. Wow. What happened? You see, God knew that his call was going to be personal. It was going to be powerful. And it was going to have purpose. And so he had to catch him at the right time and the right way with the right training to get him ready. Everybody in here, 
you've got a call in your life, whatever it may be, is personal, is powerful, and it's got purpose. Every time I think about Brother Wayne taking those kids to South Carolina, you can't get much more powerful than that. That's powerful. That's a powerful purpose, bro. And I applaud you for that. I know you don't take any glory for it, none whatsoever, but I still applaud you for it. It gets my heart to think about it because that's a ministry. Okay? There's some people that have seen them that they work hard to take care of other people. You know, they work hard to, to they work in the areas, work in the city, work whatever, and get around things and do things to help the homeless and to help the hungry. And it gets my heart when I see y'all doing that because that's ministry. Well, Moses, because you got an old man, I tried. It didn't work. I ain't going back. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't need me because I've already tried. I'm a nobody. Let me tell you something. God's in the business of using nobodies. If you don't think so, ask Jonah, ask Gideon, ask Rahab, ask David. God's in the business of using nobodies, people that are pushed aside, people that everybody else thinks it's over with for them and that it doesn't get any better. They're just going to keep going down, heel down, heel down, heel down, heel down. <laughs> Not realizing that God's getting you in a position that when you are used, God's going to get the glory. So, we look here. God's calling Moses. God says, uh, Moses says, I think you need to double check. I think that, that uh, you got the wrong man. And God says, look, I got the right one. So Moses struggled with his identity. He said, I just don't feel qualified. But the Bible says, as far as ministry, if I give a cup of water in the name of a prophet, I get a prophet's reward. It's not about standing up on those big old platforms and ministering to thousands of people. It says something as simple as if I give a cup of water in a prophet's name, in an apostle's name, I get that reward. Wow, a cup of water. Saying that ministry is a lot more than than this super duper waffle looper stuff. Ministry is getting down and dirty and getting down to where people are at and getting down to where they live. And working with him. So he thought God had the wrong man. God's response? Wow, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm with you. Can you imagine what you could do with God if you could take that excuse away? Who am I? Who am I? That's not just a question, it's an excuse. Who am I? How can God use me? Did I raise your hands? <coughs> Please don't raise them. But just recently, how many times have you said to yourself, how could God use me? Look where I've been. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've said. Look at how I act from time to time. How can God use me? Just remember, Moses, when he thought he was ready, he wasn't even close. It took 40 years to get him broke down. Some of y'all might think, well, I was ready 10 years ago, 5 years ago, last year, 20 years ago, but I don't feel so ready anymore. Guess what? You're the one getting ready right now. You're the one that's getting ready. Why? Because what you see is their demotion is getting ready to be a front motion. You just got to trust you. So, so, look at this. Who saved us and called us to, the, to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It's not about what you did. <coughs> the grace of the law, and I tell people this all the time, and I'm going through, going through those detention centers. I said, don't you know if God wants to use you to go, look where I'm at. And so I hold that Bible up and say, do you know where most of that New Testament was written from? And a lot of the Old Testament, they go, where I sit in prison.
Three quarters of the New Testament was written by Paul, and the majority of those three quarters were written by him. I tell guys all the time, this is a speed bump. It's not a stop sign, it's a speed bump. For Moses, the wilderness was not a stop sign, it was a speed bump. Some of y'all in here right now, you're getting it confused. You're thinking that God's holding up a stop sign, he's going, no, slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Watch tells me that all the time, he's doing something, she'll go, she'll go, your ADHD is kicking in big time. She said, slow down. You know, we were building a Sukkot. How many know what a Sukkot is? A Sukkot is for the mint for the festival of booths. They were going through right now. It's this whole week coming up. It's a holy week. And of course, Jesus fulfilled all of the feast in his life. But this is one that says, I want you to do this throughout the generations, and when we get on the other side, that's one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a festival of booths. Zechariah tells us that. And the festival of booths was you build a shanty and you build so you can see the stars and you build out light stuff and for one week you stayed in it, you ate your meals in it, you slept in it. Well, we're not going to sleep in it, but we've been eating our meals in it because we haven't done this. My wife kept saying, I want to do this, I'm going to do this, and we try to go in places because they had Sukkot festival and stuff, and none of it actually seemed to be really biblical. So, you build a booth. And it was funny. Because I'm in there going at it, and what I said, Okay. Yeah. Oh, we got this. I go, okay. It's getting dark soon. She says, I know, but we got this. I just got this. All right. And so we've been in now for two meals. It's really awesome because we've never done that before. Does it? Make me any more super spiritual anybody else? No, it's just a significant thing that we're doing. It's just significant. It's just something we're doing ourselves. And it's very powerful. And man, I wish we'd done it before now because it's really, really, really awesome. Because every time I was sitting there looking up, can't see the stars yet because it's clouds every night. But I can't see the street light. And the wind's blowing through the through the curtains. And I think about, man, how would it have been to be back in those days, wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, and God take care of you, but you had to build this stuff simple because you never knew when the cloud was going to move, but you had to take it down and follow the cloud. So a very powerful, very, very powerful thing. So God was trying to tell Moses, Speed bumps over. I'm here to tell you something y'all today. Your speed bumps over. Just some of the others, you still own that speed bump. But there's no stop sign. Alright? No stop sign, just a speed bump. You know what fish tell us a joke about the elephant and the mouse crossing the bridge? So God said, God told the boat, said, You're not going by yourself, I'm going with you. I'm going to lead the way. I'm going to take care of Moses. You're going to be my contact. You're going to be the one down there, but I'm going to be doing this through you. <coughs> we seem to forget that. It's not us doing it. It's God doing it through us. You know, it's kind of like a mouse and the elephant walking on the bridge. That bridge shook, boom, 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 boom. When they got the other end of the bridge still shaking, they get to the other end of the bridge, and the mouse looks up at the, at the elephant and says, well, we sure shook that bridge, didn't we? That mouse didn't shake that bridge. The elephant did, but they went as a team. So, number one, he had a little spiritual inferiority complex. Didn't think he met the criteria because he no longer was a king. He was a shepherd, which was the lowest of occupations that he did. One more excuse, and then we're going to close up. Excuse number two. And God, look at you. I, where you been? I mean, I'm here worshiping. You see me go through all these troubles. You see me go through all this, God. 
40 years in the wilderness. My own wilderness. 40 years as a king, been through 40 years in my own personal wilderness. Who are you, God? He says, he says, can you imagine, can you imagine that? God, I don't even know you well enough. I, I don't even know, I can't, I don't even know how to even put it in words, God. To describe him to the people and lack conviction concerning his relationship with God. So look, God's response, I am who I am. I am who I am. I am ever present. I am everything you need. Matter of fact, God started it. I am that I am. Jesus finished it. I am the bread of life. I am the truth, the way, the life. I am the life. I am the Savior of the world. God started it. Jesus finished it. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Man, a thousand generations, that's a lot. He is God. Yahweh, the self-existent one. He hadn't heard from God in 40 years. He felt something in his heart. 40 years earlier, it got him in trouble. Didn't realize that the reason it got him in trouble was that tug on his heart was the trigger. The trigger to all of this that he was getting ready to do. Some of y'all don't understand that some of the things that happened to you, and you go, I was really, really trying. God says, what you did was you just finally pulled the trigger, and now I can put it all in motion so I can use you like I want to. God, where were you at? Right? I was watching. I was guiding. I was taking care of business. Now let's get up and do something for me. For him, not me, for him. You know, <clears throat> I want you to do this for me. We got at least three more excuses to go, okay? We'll do it next week. I want you to ask yourself, be honest, don't look at your neighbor, and when I ask you this, it's going to be a tough one, ask yourself, have I settled into making excuses versus making it happen? Well, I would, but I'm just not good enough. I would, but I really can't do it at first. I would, but, you know, look what I've been through. I would, but I spent 40 years in the wilderness. I would, but you don't know the only people I work with. Think of all the excuses. Gideon said, my family's the least in Israel, and I'm the least in them. Here goes the excuses. God said, I'm here to use you, Gideon. So, have you settled in the making excuses versus making it happen? I, it gets me when I hear people talking about talking to other people, and I, I start hearing the excuses. Not reasons, excuses. When I hear reasons, that's fine. Like I said before, when I hear people just start making excuses for others, just excuses, my mind and my ears just shut off in the conversation. Shut off. I walk away. You hear people talk. I might not even be in the conversation, but I'm hearing all of a sudden excuses start going. Once I start hearing excuses like that, okay, I, I guess I'm <clears throat> I can't hear from a woman. So have you settled? Settled. Settled. 
I, I worked with one of the engineers at the foundry. And he was a make it happen kind of guy. He got slapped so hard. Engineers got slapped anyway because if, if it was good, we got no credit. If it was bad, we got all, all the credit. Whether it was just or not. And this guy would get one time after another, after another, after another, but he kept on getting up swinging. And I was so amazed at him, and I tried to do the same thing as keep on swinging. And then I watched him settle. And as he settled, which was the easy way, his excellence started falling. His achievements started getting smaller. And when people would ask him at our meetings, and I started hearing excuses, I'd go to myself, God help that man. God help him get back to his excellence. Next question. Is my default for what else? Is my default for coming? Become search for someone to blame <clears throat> or seek to take responsibility. It's easy to find somebody to blame. Usually in a family, we do some counseling now and some psychology for just a minute because it's also biblical. Usually in a family, the family has a family scapegoat. Biblically, what a scapegoat was, was you took the government who was innocent, and you took your sins and your faults, and you put it on that goat, and you run him out. Run him out, run him out of the cabin. He was a scapegoat because he hadn't done anything wrong. It wasn't his fault. But you put stuff that was your fault, put it on him, Symbolically, and run away. Families. That's getting numbers. There's a certain person that when something happens, they always the one to get blamed. No matter how they do with it, they get the blame. They took the whipping. I really don't want to look for a scapegoat. I don't want to be a scapegoat. I want to take responsibility for my life, for everybody I'm ministering to. I want to take responsibility and watch what God will do. Because remember, a man who is good at making excuses is some good at anything else. Can God use you? The next time, the next time that you think God can't use you, I want to show you something here. Ready? God can't use you. He used Noah. Noah got drunk. He used Abraham. Abraham thought he was too old. Jacob, he was a liar. Did you know what he just said? To Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Sometimes he says Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Israel is when Jacob finally had a meeting with God and dealt with this problems that he had to deceive him. Because Jacob means hill catcher. It means deceiver. Israel means prince of God. When God is going to Moses, and Moses is having all his excuses, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the deceiver, the conniver, the person always trying to get things to his advantage. Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer. Gideon was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were way too young, they thought. David had an affair and was a murderer. 
Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. Zacchaeus thought he was too small. Paul was too religious. He was, he was a murderer. He had guys killed. Families broke up. They lost their jobs. Their houses were taken from them. They were destroyed. Look at all these people that God used mightily. And the greatest one of all, Lazarus is dead. God still used him. I think about that every time. Or good places with my team Beth and Grace said, and God's got this, and this one today says even way I win. <clears throat> Although she's been dead for years now, every week, I can't tell you how many of these things I give away. I've given away over 900, maybe a thousand by now. Lazarus, even though he was dead, God still used him. Now, no more excuses. This question, no more excuses. No more excuses. God can use you to your full potential. You know that? Besides, remember this, you are the message. You're just the message. Wow. Up here today, I'm just a messenger. How's you like this? You can have results, or you can have excuses, but not both. Here's your challenge for this week. This week's challenge. Refuse to look for excuses, instead of for reasons to get it done. This will change your life, and it will change your affections. I'm going to do. I'm going to mention this later on because I got a sermon on it. But I just want to say, I found out I had a nickname about it. I didn't know I had. They called me a preacher and all that, but I had a nickname. The high ups gave me a nickname. I was their chief problem solver, but they gave me a nickname. And the first time I heard it, I got kind of offended. Then I said, "Wait a minute, that's awesome." Here was my nickname. It said, give it to Bulldog. First time I just heard Bulldog, Bulldog, right to start with it, it came, what? Then it hit me. You know, on the British flag is the Bulldog, or the Bulldog, and the mascot's the Bulldog. You know why the British their mascot was the Bulldog? The Bulldog has an underbody. The bulldog is one of the, it's got a very powerful grip, and it's one of the only dogs that can bite you and not have to release you to breathe. He can just keep on holding on. Seemed like one eternity. And I went and asked the COO one day, I said, so why are you calling him bulldog? He said, because when you sink your teeth into it, you're not letting go until it's fixed. There are no excuse. I'm kind of uh, and I like. Remember, there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. <clears throat> God knows there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. Come up here, random place on salt. God knows there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. You see, Moses, he didn't see everything. He didn't know those 40 years in the desert was preparation for what he was about to do. But he was getting ready to go in the wilderness another time for another 40 years, and he was going to have a whole bunch of people, a couple of million people. And he was going to have to lead them, shepherd them, king, lead, shepherd, guide. And so that 40 years was crucial. The first 40 is one other thing that got him into Egypt again. But the shepherd's lot got him to the wilderness. 
the next 40 years. <clears throat> God's got you. God's got you. God's got you. He knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Trust him. Everybody stand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Things I, I think about all the time as far as excuses is somebody comes to me and says, Can you please help me? Can you counsel with me? Can you help me get through this problem? And I'll go, Sure. Not a problem. And we'll spend an hour after hour after hour talking about it. And I'll say, Okay, I need you to go home. I got two sheets of paper here with stuff. I need you to read this and start applying it to your life. And I'll see him a week later. And I'll say, Did you read it? Seventy-five percent of the time, you don't answer me. I didn't have time. I guess I tell people when they tell me that, you just gotta go, they're there, it'll be okay, I quit, I quit. Now when people say I don't have time, you know what I tell them? Let's change that to I didn't make time. Which is an amazing thing that God's done for all of us. We've all got seven days a week, 24 hours a day. All of us. Now, some of us are busier than others to have more responsibility. I'm not, I'm not crazy. I know that some people have very little responsibility. Some have a lot of responsibility. But I don't have time is probably the biggest excuse right here in the Christian world. I don't have time. Did you read that book? I don't have time. Well, I have to see you a ball game. I have to did you see that movie? Like, yeah, I read it. I got three movies I read it. And I went last day and I said, well, did you read that little thing? I didn't have time. But you had time to watch those three movies. You had time to read that ball game. Your life's in shambles and you really need help. But you don't have time. So read that paper. This week, look for the for excuses. Refuse the for reasons to get it done. And take out your own vocabulary. I didn't. Have take it out, throw it away. Now I tell people, and they say, Did you do that? And I'll go, oh, Well, I didn't make the time. Not I didn't have time, I didn't make the time. And if you can do that one right there, your excuse wagon start to take off and leave. Watch what God will do for you. I know this year might not be the easiest, but I promise you you're going to grow from this. If you'll get it in your heart, you will grow, 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 grow. And you're going to see something happen in your life that you thought was getting God. And God's going to raise it back up. you got to trust Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and you don't feel like you're as close to God as you should be, but you want to get closer, would you raise that hand? Nobody's going to Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless them.
Maybe you're here today. And you had it all together, and then God put you in the wilderness. And now you're thinking, ah, he was in not me. Who? Didn't realize that God was up in your stock. He was doing something special for you that you didn't even realize and see. If you're in here and you're in that wilderness, first off, I want you to know it's not a stop sign, it's a speed bump. And number two, you're not being de loaded, you're being front loaded. God is doing something in you that can't be done any other way. Can't judge it by your eyes, you get to judge it by His. And you may never see His until you get into heaven. If you're here today and you're in that wilderness, nobody looking around, I'm here to tell you, God's doing something special for you, although you can't see it right now. Would you put that hand up and say, just pray for me. Just pray for me. I just need prayer because I'm going in that wilderness and I need God. Some of you, you just started. Others, you're getting ready to step out. But blow away that excuse, I don't have time. Because that'll kill you. Let's pray together. Father, Father, I love you. I love you. I praise your name. I praise you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your I thank you, God. Thank you, God. That you give us. That you give us. Chance after chance after chance after chance. After chance. And it never stops. It never stops. Until we take that last break. I ask you right now, right now, to help me, to help me, to embrace you, to embrace you in my wilderness, my wilderness, and know, and know that this wilderness is not a stop sign, wilderness, but a speed bump. And I thank you, I thank you, that you love me enough, you love me, to let me in, to let me in. Ask you also, God, ask you also, God, to use me, to use me, and help me, and help me, to quit use. To put you in the excuse, the excuse. I did have I thank you for it. Thank you for it. And I thank you, God, thank for your grace, for your grace, and your mercy. Thank your mercy. In the name Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, and then uh, Brother B dismisses his prayer. Ready? Who brought us here? Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our good bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive our trespasses. And then you lose some intonation to deliver us from evil. That is the light, the power, the power, and the glory forever. Heavenly Father, please help us to take excuses out of our vocabulary. So that we not use an excuse of why we didn't get something to get done. We get out and we do it. For it is your will that we be protected people. In Jesus' name. And Lord, help us to meet that goal. For everywhere we go, people see us. They will see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.